The art of Renaissance Florence came out of the city-states of central Italy. By contrast, our story of art in northern Europe begins in the late medieval courts of France. It was a time of violent contrasts. In the luxury of the court, the Duke enjoys his banquet, while the peasants shelter from the snow. In their hovel, they bear themselves by the fire. These illuminations were painted around 1414 by three brothers from the Netherlands, the Limburgs, at the French court of the Duke of Berry. The detailed realism of these faces and landscapes was to be a key feature of northern art in this period. The Limburg brothers began their career working for the brother of the Duke of Berry, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy. The Valois Dukes of Burgundy established one of the strangest and most extravagant courts of late medieval Europe. From their base in Burgundy, by marriage and diplomacy, they acquired large areas of the Netherlands to build an extensive, though fragmented, state of vast wealth. In 1404, Duke Philip the Bold died at the Stag Inn near Brussels. Twenty years earlier, his royal sculptors had begun work on Philip's tomb. One of them carved these images of the funeral procession which transported his body back to Burgundy. Clothed in the habit of a Carthusian monk, Philip's embalmed body was sealed in a great lead coffin and then carried in a funeral cortege which took nearly seven weeks to wind the 250 miles from Brussels to Dijon. Accompanied by his sons, his chaplains and members of his royal court, the hearse was drawn by six horses caparisoned in black with the blue banners of Burgundy fluttering at its corners. At Dijon, it was received not only by the weeping clergy, but by a hundred chosen townspeople and a hundred poor, also clad in black at the Duke's expense. And so, as with the other great royal and ducal rituals of the later Middle Ages, death itself could be turned into an act of public theater. Philip's tomb itself lay just outside Dijon at the Carthusian monastery of Champmol. It took nearly 30 years to complete and was finished after his death in 1414. Three sculptors worked on it, but among them was a forgotten genius of European art, the man who conceived this remarkable evocation of that funeral procession, Klaus Sluter. He came from Haarlem in the Netherlands and worked for the Duke of Burgundy for 20 years in Dijon. Sluter's most impressive carving was a life-size monument known as the Well of Moses, with prophets from the Old Testament around its base. The well was placed at the center of the monastery of Champmol, where the Dukes of Burgundy were buried. In Italy, Donatello was only 10 years old when Sluter began to carve these figures, which display an intense realism never seen before in European sculpture.
As this reconstructed model shows, the well of Moses was originally brilliantly painted. The prophets deliver their prophecies like figures from a medieval mystery play. The whole piece was intensely theatrical, linking the prophecies of the Old Testament to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and originally the well was surmounted by a life-sized crucifixion group. This crucifix was smashed to pieces during the French Revolution, and the largest fragment that remains is the head of Christ. Somehow, Sluter's carving conveys both the agony of Christ on the cross and the release from suffering which death has brought. Life at the Burgundian court was not always dominated by thoughts of God and death. The Dukes of Burgundy were famous for their tournaments, their banquets and their extravagance. They placed great importance on all the arts so their court could be seen and heard as one of the grandest in Europe. Because this was a travelling court, moving between the palaces of their scattered duchy, many of their artistic treasures were portable, tapestries, metalwork, and illuminated manuscripts. All this medieval extravagance was principally paid for by the Burgundian Netherlands, the most highly urbanized area of Europe. During the 15th century, Bruges became the busiest port in northern Europe, while Brussels and Ghent became two of its largest industrial cities. we can catch a realistic glimpse of Flemish urban life through the window of religious paintings, such as this Madonna by Robert Campin. In Italy, 15th century artists used perspective and the study of antiquity to depict a suitable setting for their religious paintings. By contrast, a northern painter such as Campin in his Merode altarpiece saw no great divide between the distant past and the present, between the look of antiquity and the late medieval world. Joseph in his carpenter's workshop is depicted with detailed realism, both the tools of his trade and the townscape visible through the window. One sign of the success of Bruges as a trading centre was its wealthy community of Italian merchants and bankers. Out of this community came the most famous wedding portrait in Western art. Here in 1434, Jan van Eyck shows Giovanni Arnolfini, a hugely wealthy Italian moneylender and tapestry dealer to Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy. He is about to marry an equally wealthy young Italian, Giovanna Cenami, whose family lived in France. And here you see the shifty, rabbity banker, one hand raised and the other joined to that of his new bride. The artist proclaims his witnessing presence in a bold Gothic legal inscription in Latin. This reads, Jan van Eyck was here. While Italians were developing their illusionistic art with the assistance of mathematically recent perspective, northern painters, led by Jan van Eyck, used many translucent layers of pigments in quick-drying oils to produce uniquely convincing pictorialism. Among Jan's most compelling portraits, this man's features may be the artist's own. 
they have some of that fixed, almost hypnotic quality that sometimes results from staring into a mirror for self-portrayal. We also know that artists in the 15th century often wore such flamboyant red turbans, which is another reason for suspecting that the identity of the sitter is Jan van Eyck himself. The most famous European painter of his day, Jan van Eyck was also a diplomat, map maker, and chemist. Enormously learned, he was concerned with Latin and Greek and studied Hebrew mysticism. Here, Jan van Eyck depicts the most powerful figure at the Burgundian court, Chancellor Rolin kneeling before the Madonna. In such works, a saint usually presented the donor, the person paying for the painting, to the virgin and child. But Roland decided to appear before the Madonna without benefit of introduction. So Van Eyck linked the figures with Romanesque architecture and a view of the heavenly city and landscape beyond, realized by the almost magical glow of the oil medium. Nicholas Rolin was the chief minister of Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy for nearly 40 years. He became one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in Europe. And at the height of his career, he made a spectacular donation to charity. The Hotel Dieu, or God's Hostel, a hospital for the poor, was founded by Chancellor Rollin in Beaune, close to the Duke's capital at Dijon. The initials of Nicolas Rollin and of his wife, Guigon de Salin, and their coats of arms appear in the stained glass and the floor tiles of the buildings, making it clear that the hospital was a gigantic memorial to the donors. On this Sunday, the 4th of August, 1443, neglecting all human cares and in the interests of my salvation, in recognition of the goodness of our Saviour, from whom all benefits proceed, I found and donate irrevocably in the town of Bone, a hospital for the poor and the sick. Such acts of piety were often performed by the rich in the Middle Ages for the good of their souls, but seldom on this massive scale. In this case, contemporaries viewed Roland's wealth with hatred and his professions of charity and spirituality with cynicism. And it's one of the mysteries of the time that such men seem to combine an austere, rigid piety with excesses of cruelty, of calculating greed, and of, to us, sickening ostentation. King Louis XI himself said of Roland, he made enough people poor to make a pauper's hospital necessary and the hospital was where the poor came to die. Here in the Middle Ages were two rows of 31 beds where the poor lay two or three to a bed. The 15th century was a time of terrible famine, war, and plague, and in a bad year, thousands of people could die in a place like this. And so, thoughtfully, the chancellor had provided that each of his patients could look from his or her bed to the wall above the high altar, where there hung a tremendous vision of the end the last judgment of Roger van der Weyden. On the day of judgment, the dead rise from the earth to be judged by their savior. Christ sits enthroned in glory above the archangel Michael, who holds the scales which will weigh the vices and virtues of all who are to be judged on the day of reckoning. St. John the Baptist, Mary, the Twelve Apostles, and other holy figures intercede on behalf of the sinners, and the lucky few are ushered through a bland Gothic gateway into the kingdom of heaven. This painting was done with bright colors, so it could be seen by the sick even from their deathbeds. 
Van der Weyden excelled at depicting the inner emotions of his characters. And on Christ's left, we see the damned in a state of frenzy, drawn inexorably towards the flames of hell. There are no demons to drag them down. In the words of a local theologian, the weight of sin upon the conscience is sufficient to make the damned fall into hell as heavy as lead. As the year 1500 approached, many were convinced they were living through the last days of mankind. While the Turks threatened Christendom from the outside, Europe was tormented by political and religious tensions. In the Netherlands, Hieronymus Bosch painted this strange vision of hell, composed of images suggesting the psychological disintegration of the late medieval world and the tensions of his time. Industrial furnaces, armies on the march, artillery bombardments at night. The German printmaker who took the apocalypse, as described in the revelation of St. John the Divine, and transformed it into his own pictorial territory was Albrecht Dürer, the first major artist to publish his work in the form of a book. Dürer exploited contemporary interest in the revelations of St. John by designing and carving 15 woodcut block prints which reduced the 22 chapters of St. John's text into an extraordinarily action-packed visual adventure which swept Western Europe. It made him the most famous graphic artist of his day, and the series itself was of enduring fame, used by artists, sculptors, painters, graphic designers for the next 500 years. Albrecht Dürer was clearly a precocious artist. He was the son of a Nuremberg goldsmith and drew this portrait of himself at the age of 13. He became the first artist in Western art to make a detailed series of self-portraits throughout his life, analyzing his changes of mood and image. Dürer studied nature with the same incisive vision with which he analyzed himself. He was one of the first artists to go into the open to paint watercolors from direct observation. He wrote, we German artists have grown up like wild trees in the forest, knowing nothing of the rules of proportion and perspective. These watercolors were painted while Dürer was traveling from Nuremberg to Venice. He wished to learn from Italian art, and to have his own status as an artist acknowledged in the land of the Renaissance. Venetian paintings from around 1500 show the city that Dürer visited, the wealthiest trading center in Europe. Giovanni Bellini, who painted this portrait of the Doge of Venice, was described by Dürer as very old, but still the best of the Venetian painters. The young German was gratified that this Italian master should ask him for one of his works. Bellini and his contemporaries had been influenced by northern art, its realism, its sensitivity to light and landscape, and Bellini had become a master of the northern technique of oil painting.
In his depiction of St. Francis, the whole landscape seems to convey the ecstasy of the saint's vision. After Dürer's second Venetian journey, he engraved some of his most intricate, complex plates. In Night, Death and the Devil, the artist takes the equestrian statue he had seen in Italy and rides it into a northern forest. Here is the man of action, the warrior, blind to the perils that surround him, death at his side, the devil and devastation in his wake. Dürer's radiant engraving of Saint Jerome is a hymn to the contemplative life, showing his favorite saint in sacred study. Subtlety of light and the detailed depiction of the interior all recall Van Eyck's art. Dürer was a northern genius who succeeded in assimilating the lessons of the south. The last and most extreme statement of northern religious art was painted by the artist we know as Matthias Grunewald. The Isenheim altarpiece, a massive work in three stages, was painted around 1515 for an Antonite monastery which specialized in the care of skin diseases. Diseases which may have influenced Grunewald's treatment of the crucifixion. Painted with horrific immediacy, like a monstrous affliction. Grunewald's art conveys the extremes of the Christian faith, ranging from agony to ecstasy. And in the second stage of the altarpiece, the Virgin Mary receives the Archangel Gabriel's Annunciation. An angelic orchestra in the Temple of Solomon celebrates this union of heaven and earth with its celestial music. These harmonious sounds may also refer to musical therapy that was practiced in medieval hospitals. In the final opening, St. Anthony is shown meeting St. Paul the Hermit in his desert retreat. And finally, St. Anthony's temptation in the wilderness is conveyed through Grunewald's extraordinary blend of wild fantasy and intense realism, elements that would soon be swept aside by the new canons of classical idealism from Renaissance Italy. In the corner, a fearfully diseased demon clutches his prayer book. A Gothic inscription could apply both to him and to the patients at the hospital of St. Anthony. Where are you, good Jesus? Where are you? Why haven't you come to heal my wounds? Five years after Grunewald painted the Isenheim altarpiece, Albrecht Dürer made the last of his journeys. Not southwards to Italy this time, but westwards to the Netherlands, to Brussels and to Antwerp. And there comes one of those electric moments when the life of art and the current of history come together. For there, Dürer was astonished by the beauty of looted Aztec gold, which had been unloaded in ships from Mexico. Wonderful works of art, he called them, the like of which he had never seen in his life. It was also a vision of the future, for the center of gravity of the West was beginning to shift from the Mediterranean to the Western seaboard, and to towns like Antwerp and London, which would finance the domination of the West up to the present day. But that lay in the future. In the story of art, the powerhouse was still Italy, and the time of Dürer in the North was, in the South, the time of Michelangelo. And in Rome, the Renaissance was about to reach its climax. Thank you.